Okay, hello, how you going? This one is in response to a comment that we're just having like a conversation. Um, so I'll just show you this comment yep. that was left. So, I said this, okay? So then I get this. He said Jesus did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. In fact, he said he did, don't even think he came to abolish it. Jesus specifically said anyone... They relax as the least of these commandments from the law and prophets will be the least of the kingdom of heaven. But those that do teach in them shall be the greatest. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, when um, those two nails were driven in and he said it is done my father why why have you forsaken me and then he goes it is done um he said you say the Ten Commandments given by the mouth of God himself are written by the finger of God himself are null and void. You do not have the power to nullify anything God has said and his sons only says and does what his father says and does. So we know Jesus didn't nullify his father's commandments either, nor does he have the authority since Jesus is himself subject and obedient to his father. Jesus kept the commandments and he is our example. If he broke the commandments of the father, then he sinned, which... We know he most certainly did not. Can you prove the Ten Commandments are null and void with Scripture? When Jesus asked how to inherit eternal life, what was his answer? I said, by the way, thank you for your work. He said, by the way, thank you for your research and your history. I enjoyed you. We knew for a while. I said, thanks for your support. I didn't say I changed or had the power to nullify anything God has said or his son had said and done. The Bible and Torah have said it. I will help by sharing some information on a video. My, both my father is a pastor, as was my grandfather and great-grandfather. They, my dad and grandfather, had told me several times these passages. The churches don't like to share this knowledge. Thank you. So he asked me, can I prove the Ten Commandments are null and void with Scripture? Yes, I can. Okay. These issues must be answered for a person to obtain the truth about the Ten Commandments and the law being abolished and replaced by the new covenant. The answers must conform to the intent of the content scriptures. The opinions and conjecture can own, play no role in resolving the conflict between constitution and advocating law, keeping ordinances also so, and those who claim salvation by grace through the faith in the finished work of cavalry. What is the convent of the law? And he was there with the Lord forty days, forty nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables of the word of the convent, the Ten Commandments, Exodus thirty four twenty eight. The convent of the law is the promise God unlettedly made with Israel prior to giving the Ten Commandments. The convent is simply is simple in language, but is great in complete application. And he said, Behold, I make a convent before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all earth nor in any nation or the people among which thou shalt see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe, though, which I command thee this day, but, but behold, I drive out before the Amorite, the Canaanite and the Hittite, the Preserite and the Hivite and the Jezebite. This covenant marvels that are miracles, wonders and blessings. The terrible thing is... Not something frightening to the Israelites. The word means instead fearful in the sense of reverence. God would be forced through the gentle pagans to be reverence of the Israelites 
and this brought about by terrible or fearful things that the Lord would do on behalf of the Israelites. This is one part of the convent that comes to the idea of salvation, protection, security, guaranteed to them alone in the provisions of the Ten Commandments were reserved. The convent of the law cannot include Gentiles. Therefore, Gentiles have no business thinking they are part of the convent of the law. By adopting the observance of the Ten Commandments or keeping the regulations contained in other commandments of the Book of Law. In fact, the Israelites were not were not sent to the Holy Land to convert Gentiles to observe the Ten Commandments or invite them to join the convent on law, but to drive them out. The convent was not with the Gentile nations or any other Gentile nations. This is a convent of the law with Israel alone. This is a convent that Jesus abolished that the Gentiles may, might be made joint heirs through a new convent that contained marvels, miracles, wonders, salvation, protection, security, and through the, which the nations would be brought to reverence and the fear of judgment of the Lord Jesus Messiah and his saints, the true Israel of God. What were the Ten Commandments given in Exodus thirty four ten twenty eight text? The convent. And he said, Behold, I make a convent. Before all thy people I will do marvels, such as not been done on all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among them which shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing in which I will do thee. Observe, though, which I command to this day. Behold, I will drive out before the Ammite, Canaanite, Hittite, Prezite, the Hivite, and the Jezebite. Commandment. One of the Ten Commandments, according to Exodus thirty four ten twenty eight, take heed of thyself, lest thou make a convent with the inhumanites of the land, whether thou goes, lest it be a snare in the midst of these two. Be it, but ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Three, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous is jealous God. Let Though who make a convent with the inhabitants of the land, and let go, and they go whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and call thee, and they will eat of his sacrifice, and they'll take the daughters unto the sons, and their daughters go whoring after their gods, and make those sons go after whoring of the gods. Commandment four: Thou shalt make no molten gods, so that's like idols. Five. The feast of unleavened bread shall be kept. Seven days shall eat unleavened bread as I command thee in the time of the month of Abbe. For in the month of Abbe comes out of Egypt. Commandment 6. At the openeth of the matrix is mine, and every first thing among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male, but the first of an ass thou shalt redeem with the lamb. If thou redeem him not, thou shalt thou break his neck, all firstborn of thy sons shalt be redeemed, and none shall before me be empty. Commandment 7. Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest, and in the earning time and harvest thou shalt rest, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, all the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of angel gatherings of the year ends. Thrice a year, yeah, shall... All your men, children, appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel, for I will cast all nations before thee and enlarge thy borders, neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go out and appear by the Lord God thrice in the year. Commandment 9. Thou shalt not offer blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall sacrifice of the feasts of the Passover be left into the morning. Commandment 10. The first of the first fruits of thy land shall Bring unto the house of the Lord God. Thou shalt not see as the kid in his milk's mother's milk. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a different commandment of the Christian Ten Commandments. One, I am your Lord God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondings. You shall have no other gods before me. Two, you shall not make yourself the cave image, or any likeness, or anything that is in heaven or above, or that are earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I am your Lord God, a jealous God, visiting the antiquity of the fathers and the, and the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, 
to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name Lord God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless when he takes my name in vain. Four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of your Lord God. In it you shall not do work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who was within your gate. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Five, honor your mother and father, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God has given you. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Ten, you shall not convert your neighbor's house. You shall not convert your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his domic donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, so that's the two different versions, okay? <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for after a tenor of these words I have made a convent with thee and with Israel. And he was with the Lord forty days, forty nights, he did not either eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables of the words of the convent the Ten Commandments. There is an obvious problem here with the law keepers who claim the Ten Commandments are still binding upon the Gentiles and to be observed by the New Testament church. Those who claim the Ten Commandments are binding, binding usually run to Exodus chapter 20 for the list of commandments. Uh, those are nowhere called the Ten Commandments that were placed into the ark. We can see why it is important for the law keepers to ignore Exodus 34, 10, 28 and the convent of law and the Ten Commandments listed there that specifically say that these were put into the ark. If the Ten Commandments are binding and the correct com Ten Commandments are those in Exodus 34, 10, 28, then the law keepers are in serious trouble because they do not keep those Ten Commandments. Observance of the Ten Commandments put into the ark requires breaking down the pagan altars, images, sacred trees, observing the seven days un unlimited bread, redemption of the firstborn, going to Jerusalem three times a year for Passover, Pentecost and atonement, animal sacrifices, observance of the Passover rituals and giving the first fruits unto the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. The difficulty here is for the great law keepers because the Ten Commandments of Exodus 34, 20, 28 totally nullify the New Testament church, the local church and the New Testament ministry. All returns, all Jews and Gentiles under the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the Pharisees whom Jesus resisted and rejected. There is absolutely no testament ministry of the law to replace the Levitical priesthood of the law. The qualifications for apostle, prophet, and religious, pastor, teachers, elders, and bishops do not include anything whatsoever about law keeping or Old Testament observance. Any Old Testament observance of the law resurrects the Levitical priesthood and destroys the priesthood of Jesus Messiah. That Jesus was prophesied to be a measure like gentle priesthood more than demonstrates that on the priesthood on Mount Sinai and was not transferred to him. You know, because he rejected it, right? But not transferred to him or any of those upon him who laid hands on him ordained. Ordained then into the New Testament, the ministry requires submissions to the Mesolithic priesthood of Jesus Messiah and subsequently that of the apostles. No one may claim to be apostolic who does not accept and embrace this priesthood. The priesthood forever separates the church from the practice of the law to practice the faith of Jesus the Messiah. How come the commandments in Exodus 34, 10, 28 are not the same as Exodus 23, 17? Some scholars believe that the commandments Moses gave in Exodus 23, 17 were not the Ten Commandments, but the commandments God gave Moses prior to giving the Ten Commandments. The whole delusion by law keepers is Moses only went up one time to Mount Sinai, and this one time trip he received the Ten Commandments. That is not true. The trip up to the mountain where Moses stayed 40 days and received the convent and the Ten Commandments was not his first trip. The Israelites were already living in some commandments in Exodus 15, 26, but they were not the Ten Commandments. And I said, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that hath thee. Whatever the commandments and statutes were, 
They were not the Ten Commandments, but God expected the Israelites to observe them. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye keep my commandments and my law? Here we see that God gave the commandment about gathering the manna and the seventh day before Moses ever went up to Mount for 40 days to receive the covenant and the Ten Commandments, which when received contained the observance of the Sabbath. Moses went up to Mount of in Exodus 19.20, and God sent him back down. Then God commanded Moses to bring Aaron back up with him to the mountain, Exodus 19.24. This we assume Moses did after this trip follows Exodus 20, and Moses giving him the Israelites' commandments of God, but they were not called the Ten Commandments. It appears that the commandments given in Exodus 23.17 were given to Moses prior to his 40 days mountain trip when he went up the third time alone, because it's not until Exodus 24.12 that Moses is summoned up to the mountain, by God to receive the Ten Commandments. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tablets of stone, and a law and commandments which I have written, and thus may teach them. What is the point here? The point is that the commandments given prior to giving the Ten Commandments, and some of these commandments were incorporated into the Ten Commandments, and some were not. To confuse commandments prior to the Ten Commandments as being the Ten Commandments before they were assembled by God and classified as the Ten Commandments is wrong. It does not change that they were commandments. It changes that they were not selected out to be the Ten Specific Commandments of the Convent. Prior to the specific assembly of the Ten to be the basis of the Convent on the Law, these were not individually or collected considered to be Convent or having any connection to the Convent. It was only after God assembled the Ten Commandments that he made Convent of the Law and the Ten Commandments are found at Exodus 34, 10, 28. The commandments in Exodus 23, 7, 8, missing in Exodus 34, 10, 28, are Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God thy God in vain. Honour thy father and mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour, and thou shalt not convert. Are they still commandments? Why, of course. But they concluded to be commandments containing to the book of law apart from true and actual ten commandments given in Exodus 34, 10, 28. Some scholars are of the opinion that adultery in Exodus 20 commandments is described early, clearly in Exodus 34, 10, 28, commandment of the sons and daughters going whoring after the sons and daughters of the Gentile pagans. The word whoring means fornication, and it's taken from the Hebrew word for fornication. See Strong's 2, 21, 81, Zainer. The first meaning of Zena is to commit adultery, although it is a Hebrew word for fornication or sexual immorality. The adultery comes in with the acts of these fornications breaking the convent commitment. Adultery is then breaking the convent by committing a forbidden sin. This is when the convent of marriage is entered into between a man and a woman to fornicate with someone outside this convent would be an act of adultery of breaking the convent of marriage. This means one can act and result is two sins, not one sin, as many teach from the Catholic teachings on adultery and fornication. Thus, whoring or fornication is the sex act of sin, with someone outside the marriage convent and adultery is the sex act of sin that would be breaking the marriage convent by whoring or the act of fornication. It is understood within the Jewish teachings that any time adultery has been committed or an act of sexual fornication has been committed, there can be a no adultery without an act of fornication and sexual immorality. So, in this regard, adultery would be contained in the Exodus 34, 10, 28, Ten Commandments under a whoring. So then it appears that the Ten Commandments in Exodus 23, 17, only six are found in the convent of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34, 10, 28, that Moses was to place inside the ark. As already mentioned, it is indeed interesting that the traditional Ten Commandments are not once called the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. The words Ten Commandments appears three times in the book of Moses and not one time in the relationship of these commandments found in chapter 20. Please take note of God's statutes, ordinance, and laws are commandments. But concerning the identity of the Ten Commandments, we first mentioned in Exodus 34, 10, 28, then Deuteronomy 4, 13, and lastly in Deuteronomy 10, 4. The commandments in Exodus are commandments, but the question is, are they the original Ten Commandments or are they just commandments taken to be as the original Ten and they are not? One thing is certain, they cannot be the Ten Commandments with one set disagreeing with the other set on what these those Ten Commandments are. We shall let the Bible decide which is the true Ten Commandments, and the Bible says Exodus 34, 10, 28 are the Ten Commandments. 
The word commandments is found 136 times in the Bible, beginning in Genesis 26, 5, and lastly in Revelation 22, 14. But it must be remembered that in using the word commandment or commandments, the meaning does not describe only the 10 given in Exodus, but also all the other precepts, ordinance, and statutes given under the law in the New Testament. It must be determined that if the commandment of Jesus has been in indicated because the commandments of Jesus are falsely attributed to the Ten Commandments or either even other commandments of the law. This is false. The commandments of Jesus are nowhere called or connected to any commandments of the law as if Jesus was continuing the commandments of the law by becoming part of his kingdom, doctrine or gospel message. The Torah. I think Think not that I have come to destroy the law, Torah, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, Matt 5.17. The law here is the Torah, and the whole book of the law contains also the covenant law and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments do not exist today except in the Torah. Law keepers quote this verse as if to say that Jesus would continue the practice of the law over in the kingdom of God. This is false. True, Jesus did not come to destroy the law, and he did not destroy the law. No one has said that he did. But we do say and teach that he fulfilled the law. The passing away of the convent of the Lord does not mean it was destroyed. A marriage convent is enforced until one of the party dies, and then the marriage convent is fulfilled. We do not say that because one of the parties has died that the convent and the marriage was destroyed. Yet we know upon the death that one of the parties parties of the marriage convent is ended and it does not exist any longer all of the vows of the marriage convent come to the end the only thing that can survive the end of the marriage convent through death is the blessing of the convent board so blessings can survive a marriage convent and the blessing of god can survive the end of the law at calvary now these blessings come also upon the gentiles where before the gentiles could not share in blessings and in hope and the promises under the law the convent of the law was a marriage convent between God and Israel. When the Lord Jesus died, the convent ended with his death, not by destruction. Thus, the Lord Jesus was free to get him another bride of the church. There cannot be two marriage convents in existence at the same time. If the convent of the law was still alive after Calvary, then they would mean that there were two convents and God had a wife and a bride in the waiting. This cannot be. To claim to be under the law would place a person under the convent of marriage of Israel. No Gentile can do this. Why then are there so many who are ignorant and unlearned about the marriage of Israel and God by the convent of the law? This is plain in Paul's writings in Romans. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye shall be married to another, given to him who is raised from the dead, that we shall Bring forth the fruit unto God. Romans 7 4. Any law keeper who claims to be under the covenant of the law of God that God made for Israel is not married or in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be in both convents. Paul said we were dead to the law by the body of Christ, meaning his crucifixion and death, and that death, this death, into which we are baptized, freezes us from the convents of the law to enter into the new convent with the Jesus desire for salvation. Those Jews and Gentiles who claim to live under the law do not grasp this or you refuse to believe or receive it to be outside the kingdom of God. You may say, brother, I have the Holy Ghost. So what? Many of those who also received the Holy Ghost after the day of Pentecost went back under the law, fell from grace and returned to the temple and the Pharisee priesthood. Do not take the striving of the Spirit as a means of self-justification of law-keeping. You may end up like those other apostles who went out from the apostles and never found a place of repentance like ease you. Let the Spirit do its work, bring you fully into the light of the convent and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus reveals the purpose of God. The law does not. We have met with great revelations through the teachings of Jesus, the word law and his teachings in the Hebrew word Torah, Strong's 8451, and the word Torah describes the whole law containing all of the 613 commandments, precepts, statutes, and laws written within the five books of Moses. To say the word law is to say Torah, but to say Torah does not mean to say the Ten Commandments alone. The Ten Commandments are Torah, that is the law, but the Torah or law does not consist only of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are contained in the Torah or the whole body of the law. So then, 
any statutes, precepts, laws, ordinance, commandments may be referred to as commandments, statutes, precepts, laws, or ordinance. To say law is to say Torah and to mean to mean entire religious systems given to Israel. This must be remembered when we study Paul's writing to the Galatians or someone will want to divorce the word law from the Ten Commandments as if the law is different from the Ten Commandments and remove the Ten Commandments from the Torah as if they stand alone, aloft and apart from the whole Torah or law. Many Jew knows this is falsehood. The meaning of the word law or Torah, that is that of the regulations. Regulations that are religious in nature and associated with the man's relationship with God and others. Thus, Jesus reduced the whole Torah, the whole law, down to two ideals. One, to love thy Lord God, God with all thy heart, mind and soul. Two, to love thy neighbour as thyself. Jesus said, Upon these commandments hang all the Torah, law, and the prophet. Thus, upon the two nails were suspended all the Torah, the law, the commandments, and when those two nails were driven into the hands of Jesus, he suffered for all the sins who violated, those who violated these two commandments, and finished the transgression and the penalty of sin, and let the sinner go free. He died for us in place and removed us from both the penalty of law and also the force of law itself. The blood that came out from around those two nails became the blood of the new convent, and it is the blood of this new convent that we observe in the Lord's annual Passover memorial. Jesus also gives us revelations in regard to the Ten Commandments. He does not mention them once by title, Ten Commandments, and all of his teachings. Yes, he mentions commandments, but did he say they were the Ten Commandments of Exodus chapter twenty three seventeen, or the Ten Commandments in Exodus thirty four twenty eight, uh, thirty four ten twenty eight? No, he did not. All he did was call them commandments because they are simply laws, statutes, precepts, ordinances found in the Torah, Book of Law, Book of Commands. Yes, he did. In Mark ten nineteen, Jesus said, "The first of the commandments were: Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is with one Lord." Is this commandment the first of the Ten Commandments? Answer, no. This is a statement. This statement is not even found in the Ten Commandments, whichever set you choose. What we to conclude? We must accept the words commandment and commandments mean more than just what we call the Ten Commandments. If there are 613 commandments, precepts, statutes, laws, ordinances, then there are 613 commandments. And there are these Ten Commandments that were written upon the table of stone placed upon the ark. The Ten Commandments that were placed upon the ark and found in Exodus thirty four ten twenty eight. These were placed in the ark because they were contained the convent. The commandments in Exodus twenty three seventeen are often wrongly called the Ten Commandments, and we know these are not the convent of the law because they do not convey they do not contain the convent. The ark had contained the convent that was incorporated with the Ten Commandments in order to follow it to call the Ark of the Convent, and the convent of the true commandments are found in the Exodus. Okay, so there you go. I will keep reading, but here you go. You ask me, you said the Ten Commandments given by the mouth of God himself were written by the finger of God himself and not in void. You do not have the power to nullify anything. God said his son only says and does what his father says and does. So we know Jesus didn't nullify his father's commandments either, nor does he have the authority since Jesus himself, subject to his being a father. Jesus kept the commandments. He is our example. If he broke the commandments of the father, he had sin, which we knew he most certainly did not. Can you prove the Ten Commandments are null and void with Scripture? When Jesus asks how to inherit eternal life, what will his answer So, yeah, I just proved to you the scriptures. What is the book of law? Take this book of law and put it inside the ark of the convent of the Lord your God. That is therefore the witness against thee, Deuteronomy 31, 26. The book of law is the Torah. The Torah consists of five books of Moses, therefore called the book of law, and must be described as the original one book, contained all the other commandments or regulations by one of the people of Israel, were to worship God and to govern their affairs one another. The first thing here to notice is the book of law contains all the law, including the content of the convent and the Ten Commandments that were written upon the tables of the stone inside the ark. So 
The ark had the witness of God's convent and the law both within and without. If a person wanted to know the convent and the Ten Commandments that were in the ark, they could not look in there. They were forbidden. Only the high priest could do this. But if they look into the Torah, the book of law, and read that there was a convent upon the tables and the stones inside the ark, what was on the inside was recorded in the book upon the outside. What was on the outside of the book was the testimony of what was on the inside. When the ark and all that was inside disappeared after Solomon's death, all that remained as testimony was the book of law. This is now called the Torah. Harkaran found the book of law that has been lost for hundreds of years. 2 Kings 22, 8. Ezra read the complete book of law over a period of seven days. Nera 8, 1, 18. He read the fourth day, and the Israelites being stirred up to repentance, worshipped for a fourth day. If it was not for the Torah, this book of law, no one would know what the convent was or what the Ten Commandments were. When we see later that all the law, the Torah, was fulfilled by the Jesus Messiah and replaced with the new convent, we can understand why the Ten Commandments within the old book of the law and the book of the law containing the old convent ceased and were abolished. It matters not where the tables of stone are located or even if they exist. The kingdom of God was being established upon the new convent with the commandments of Jesus the Messiah which all must follow into heaven, to get living into heaven. So, Revelations 22, 14. So, there you go. That is a good point, that one. What was abolished? I'm up to you if you're having troubles. What was abolished? The Apostle Paul does not mean something thrown away out of this hate, spite or lawness. The law was not abolished by a vote of sinners. It was not abolished by a Christian religion coming in and taking over. It was not abolished by a joint management among religious hierarchy to modernise, adapt and mainstream the society's social trends. What Jesus did on Calvary to abolish the law was by love, grace and mercy. The complete Torah, the law, including the Ten Commandments, were made null and void, of none effect, erased, rubbed out, abolished, put away, ceased by the Messiah's sacrifice of love. When Paul used the word abolished, it was in reference to the Hebrew meaning of something being erased, abolished, wiped away, as would a marriage convent upon the death of one's spouses. But notice that Paul is not personally abolishing the law. He claims that Jesus, the Messiah, did this is through the suffering of his death through love. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Ephesians 5, 12, Revelations 1, 5. Blotting out the handiwork, or handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and it took out the way, nailing it to a cross. Colossians 2, 14. Note, since the word it in the verse is taking out, talking about the law covenant. For law keepers... To confront the law of Jesus, challenge him for satisfying the judgments of sin under the law and replacing the old convent with the new convent in his blood is outright evil. It may have been experienced in dealing with law keepers that they have the same spirit concerted and contempt as the Jews who nailed Jesus to the cross. The hatred is there against salvation by grace without law. The arrogance is there that they will keep the law anyway and the death of Jesus will not end it. The snivelling mockery is there, and the challenge, we will be Moses' disciples, fills the air. Naturally, there will be great arguments in the handwriting Paul mentions was God's own when he wrote with his finger of the covenant and the Ten Commandments in stone, or if this writing was also the book of law, which some claim Moses wrote, as if what Moses wrote is not was not instructed by God or was not written by from God's mouth. Some think that God wrote with his finger, in stone is greater than what God says with his mouth. Thus they claim the book of law that Moses wrote from the mouth of God is not as holy as the stone tablets in the ark. What so many fail to realize is that the stone tablets rep represent the hardiness of the hearts of the Israelites, while the book of law represents the word of God, writ God written in the flesh, parchments made of skin. The new covenant would be written in the hearts of flesh, not again in the tables of stone, or even yet on parchments made of skin. The new covenant is the love of God, and the love of God is shrouded by the hearts, by the Holy Ghost, not observances of the law. The point here is that Paul did not abolish anything. 
which is what the law keepers erroneously project into the arguments about observing the Ten Commandments and the Torah and the whole law. If Jesus Christ, the Messiah, brought to an end the covenant of the law, which was for Jews only, and established a new covenant that would include all nations, then the cross of Calvary became salvation for the Jews and Gentiles. Otherwise, salvation would still be for Jews only if the law covenant remained in force and was not abolished. When Paul called the whole law the law of commandments, he was referring to the Ten Commandments as well as the rest of the law. We must take note that what is Brit but that the record of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments is contained in the Book of Law. We understand the Book of Law to first be the Book of Deuteronomy and then later Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers were added. We are not saying, nor have we ever said, God was abolishing history. What abolished at Calvary was a convent given at Sinai and contained the history. The point here is, apart from the actual Ten Commandments and except the tablets of stone, there is no record of Ten Commandments except in the Book of Law. In other words, the Ten Commandments are contained in the Book of Law that also contains other commandments or regulatory ordinances. When Paul wrote Ephesians 2.15, his point was the very fact. The Law Commandments, which contain in the Book of the Law that contain the ordinance, the actual Ten Commandments, with the covenant upon the tables of stone, disappeared many hundreds of years before Jesus Christ. Christ the Messiah. So Paul would not need to address the stone tablets in particular. All he had to do was mention the convent of the law, and this is identified in the stone tables because the book of the law was only recorded of them. For anyone to, to say that the convent of the law was the book of the law in order to force observance of the Ten Commandments as a new covenant is false. Absolutely no one can produce the Ten Commandments except from two sources, the tables of stone and to the book of law. The tables of stone and the ark containing them disappeared many centuries prior to the birth of Jesus. We know the convent and the Ten Commandments are the convent in the first Kings eight twenty one. Solomon makes the following statement and I have set a place for the ark. Where is the convent of the Lord which he made with our father when he brought them out of the land of Egypt? See 2 Chronicles 6.11. Now if we go back to verse 9, we will see all that remained in the ark were two tables of stone. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put in there at Horeb. The Lord made a convent with the children of Israel and when they came out of the land of Egypt. The ark was called the ark of the covenant because it contained the covenant and the original Ten Commandments. The pot of manna was not the covenant. Aaron's word was not the covenant. The curses contained in the book of law were called curses of the covenant. The Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses and the covenant that are written in the book of the law, Deuteronomy 29, 21. So we see that the curses are punishments for not obeying the covenant of the Ten Commandments, a part of the covenant but laid up on the outside of the ark. Without the book, the law, there'd be no record of punishments for breaking the covenant or any of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments contain no judicial procedure. The covenants and the Ten Commandments collectively become the constitutional of Israel and the Book of Law became the Bill of Rights and the judicial pre procedure underlying <coughs> the constitution and holding it up, upholding it. A law without penalty is no law. If the penalty of breaking all the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross, then how can anyone say the Ten Commandments remain in force? The Ten Commandments even without the book of law, would have ceased by the death of Jesus upon the cross. Everyone knows that if a guilty man dies, guilty man of crime dies and is buried before he is caught and punished, his death ends the law and the punishment of them when he died. Laws have no effect upon the dead man. What court or judge will try a dead man for his crimes? What is a great mystery then? that we who are dead in Christ are freed from under the law and its judgments. We are raised up after the water baptism, after we died to our sins and their penalties, to walk in the newness of life and after the likeness of Jesus after his resurrection. After death, there is no manner in which to judge a person for breaking any of the Ten Commandments or any other sin. The Ten Commandments, the Book of Law, all come in one package and identified simply as the law. It is important to understand that this order to comprehend what the Apostle Paul is meaning and when he uses the word law to describe the Ten Commandments, the Book of Law, and both together, the whole law. The Ark disappeared and fake substitutes appear. The Ark was last seen in Solomon's Temple at this time 
all that was in the ark was the original covenant and the Ten Commandments. Solomon makes no mention of the book of law. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Hoab when the Lord made the covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, 2 Chronicles 5.10. Solomon started building the temple in the fourth year of his reign, 2 Chronicles 3.2. took seven years to build the temple, 1 Kings 6.3.8. Thus, in the eleventh year of his reign, the temple was completed and the Ark of the Covenant set in his place. Solomon reigned forty years, 2 Chronicles 9.30. So from the time of the dedication of the temple to Solomon's death is 29 years. In 1 Kings 14.26, a horrible event happened. 34 years after the temple was dedicated and only five years after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam did great evil and all Judah joined him. This angered God and he allowed the temple to be plundered in 29 years after the great edifice or perfection had been dedicated. All the treasures were stolen, taken down into Egypt and disappeared forever. In the fifth year, Rehoboam God sent the Shashank to king of Egypt to Jerusalem. Shashank took away to Egypt all the treasures of the house of God. Scholars believe the ark was taken at this time because after Solomon, it is not mentioned ever again in connection with the house of God. The disappearance of the ark containing the covenant and the Ten Commandments was great loss mourned by Jews ever since. All that remained to even doctrine is there ever existed with two stone two tables of stone containing the covenant was the book of law. It is within the book of law that we find the covenant of the Ten Commandments and what they contain. Because the tables of stone disappeared, all the Jews could refer to the book of law and point out the sake point out in this sacred book. The recording of the covenant of the law and the Ten Commandments as found in the Exodus chapter 38, 10, 28. Thus it comes to pass along the Israelites that are speaking of the covenant of the law, the Ten Commandments, or the ordinance in the book of law, and was called the Torah and was seen as singular convent. Neither Jesus' apostles altered this recognition. In some cases, Jesus referred to things written in Psalms as being written in the law. He quotes Psalms 82, 6 and calls this text law in John 10, 34. In John 15, 23, he quotes Psalm 69, 4 as being the law containing a prophecy or whom or who they hate him without curse. The artificial and fake substitutes shall arise. Rehoboam made artificial fake substitute, substitutes of everything in the temple after Shashuk took, sorry for saying these wrongs, took the Ark of the Ten Commandments and the other treasures to Egypt. What is strange is the Israelites did not seem to care. They accepted the substitutes as equal to authentic treasures, and these fake substitutes were took upon them honour and glory of the Israelites were now back in Egypt. There was absolutely no effort to, of Israel to go to Egypt and bring back the original te treasures. The Ark of the Covenant and the original Ten Commandments disappeared into Egypt and have not been seen since. There is an old fable that Solomon had a son by the Queen of Sheba named Menek. And this son staged a wild party when Solomon and all the priests were made drunk. During a drunken splendor, Menek claimed to have replaced the Ark with a fake one and stole the original with the Ten Commandments and took them to Ethiopia and they are there in secret today. This myth is not biblical, and the alleged ark protected by the Ethiopian Jews is nothing but a false substitute like that one we made. Absolutely everything they came of having found the original lost ark in the Ten Commandments that showed the alleged photographs showed Exodus chapter 20 style commandments and the missing altogether is the covenant written upon these stone with the Ten Commandments. This proves them all false. The ark and the Ten Commandments cease from history of Israel for Israel. We would not know what these two tablets of stone, if it were not for the book of law that contained the history and recorded in these commandments. Thus Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.15 and said, Having abolished in his flesh anatomy, even the law commandments contained in ordinance for make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Paul could not point to the tables of stone. They had disappeared centuries before. So he pointed to the book of law that contained the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments and the Ordinances. Paul viewed the law, as did all the other Jews for centuries, as the whole collection of writings are now we call the Old Testament. But more importantly, the law was a term used to describe which was given at Mount Sinai, which governed Israel in matters of religious faith and practice. Accordingly, Paul groups together Ten Commandments and other commandments as called ordinance in the New Testament into one classification and calls them collectively the law. This is not strange. All Jewish scholars do the same. We now have prepared. We are now prepared to see what was abolished, and 
brought to an end, finished, completed, and fulfilled in a very person of Jesus Christ and what was nailed to the cross. What does the word abolish mean? Having abolished in his flesh the enemy, even the law of the commandments contained in his audience, ordinance, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Ephesians 2.15, a abolished Greek, make no effect. The word katego translates to bring in to naught. Romans 3.3, 3, Romans 4.13. Fourteen Galatians three seventeen Galatians five four one Corinthians one twenty eight one Corinthians two six done away in one Corinthians thirteen ten two Corinthians three seven eleven fourteen failed in one Corinthians ceased in Galatians eleven six vanished away in one Corinthians make void in Romans three thirty one cumber in Luke thirteen seventeen deliver in Romans seven six lose in Romans seven two Put away in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. Put down in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Destroy in Romans 6, 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 13. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Hebrews 2, 14. And abolish in 2 Corinthians 3, 13. Ephesians 2, 15. And 2 Timothy 1, 10. It is clear from these passages that whatever was abolished completely became null and void. Did man do it? No. Who took the law away? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, took it away. The law covenant and institute the new covenant. What did Jesus abolish? He caused to cease, to vanish away, to fulfill by him the covenant of the law in the original Ten Commandments contained in the book of law. The word ordinance in Greek means dogma and translated to decree. See Luke 2, 1, Acts 16, 4, Acts 17, 17, and audience. Ordinance, see Ephesians 2, 15, Col- Colossians 2.14, and the word ordinance in the Old Testament means statues, and this means regulations that were considered laws. The laws were also called commandments. The term is then changeable. The Ten Commandments were ordinance and statues. The Book of Law contained ordinance of the Old Commandment. So Paul's commandments contained in ordinance is easily here understood to be both the Ten Commandments and other commandments contained in ordinance. Through the covenant of the law, sin was identified and exposed. Romans three nineteen to twenty, Romans seven thirteen, Galatians three nineteen to twenty five. The law covenant was God's promise to keep the Jews a distinct godly people until Messiah would come, usher in a new covenant. Moses prophesied that after the Messiah came, all Israel would be gathered to him and be taught, and whoever would not be hearken to the prophet would be destroyed from all among the people. Acts three twenty two to twenty three. The new covenant would be placed into the hearts of all the people by teaching, and Jesus did this for three and a half years. For these people's hearts is wax grows hard, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I will hear them. Heal them. Matthew thirteen fifteen. Salvation was not written by the tables of stone or in the book of law. It was written by person, Jesus Christ, Messiah. Conversation was not by keeping of the law or by hearing of the law. It was by hearing Jesus Christ compound the com- expound the commandments and the kingdom of God, healing for the soul, the making of the whole lost of the world by Adam and Eve. was not by the law written in the tables of of stone or the Ten Commandments, but by Jesus Christ the Messiah. What was the law what the law could not do, Jesus did. Jesus was greater than both the Ten Commandments in the tables of stone in the Book of Law. He was making walking the Word of God. Those who trust in the Word completely for salvation will receive into their hearts a new covenant, his doctrine, his commandments, and only shall have right to the tree of life in New Jerusalem. Revelations twenty two fourteen be abolished or to make dead through the dead of his flesh in calvary through the death of his flesh in enmity hatred against sin even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances this means that by the death of jesus taking the penalty of all sins under the law the law was completely satisfied according to the condemnation and the judgment fulfilled thereby eternally abolished ephesians 2 14 to 15 colossians 2 14 17 corinthians 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 15. Jesus fulfilled the law not by observance, but by taking punishment for the sin of the law and fulfilled the death penalty which the law demanded to fulfill a person's obligation after breaking it. C. To make himself of twain 
one new man, so making peace. The purpose of ending the law, the Ten Commandments, and the Book of Law was to do away with the law that they had enemy hatred against sin directed only at Jews and where the Gentiles were under no obligations. Thus, the body of his flesh, Jesus, destroyed the enmity, hatred against sin, against Jews, and removed the middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles, and then shut the Gentiles out of the temple. God plans to make both Jews and Gentiles into one new Israel, one new class of holy saints, one new man, one church, so making peace between the righteous judgments of the law of God and nations. Ephesians 6, 3, 6. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Galatians 3, 28, Colossus 3, 11. Until the law was abolished, the Gentiles had no means of salvation under the law because salvation under the law was for Jews only, and Jews only because of the covenant of the Ten Commandments. Salvation of the Gentiles during the law period was not by law, but by faith and continuing in a righteous life. This is all found in Noah, Abraham, Meshulach, and Job, other great Gentiles who showed a pattern of a godly life and acceptance before God. All Jewish Sabbaths were abolished at the same time as the Mosaic law. Those who claim that the Sabbath seventh day is still binding will not often not observe the other Sabbaths. All festivals were Sabbath, as well as every seventh year and every fifth year jubilee, fiftieth year jubilee. Sabbath keepers make a lot of excuses why they do not observe the other Sabbaths. Some confess that yes, they were ended at the cross. But they maintained that the seventh day was Sabbath, was started by God at creation and it never end. But Jesus did not teach the Sabbath would be binding because it existed since creation and neither did the apostles. So this argument is novel, but it's not true. This is not honestly in biblical interpretation or in observance of the new covenant of Jesus. Where it is true that Jesus lived and died under the law, he observed the law, he fulfilled the law, it is not true that he intended for the law to be gospel of salvation that he taught to the apostles and sent to them to all nations. They understood perfectly that they had great commission to carry to the, to the world the commandments of Jesus. And on the final day of this being on earth, in Acts 1, Jesus gave the apostles commandments. None of them was about the Sabbath, keeping all the apostles would not have missed preaching it. The only fault of the apostles, if it can be deemed such, was the delay in going to all nations but staying among Israel and Jews. Because of this, the first 10 years of the kingdom of God was in translation, transition from worship in the temple and synagogues to worship in the church groups from rituals of law. And the Levitical priesthoods to the teachings of the commandments of Jesus as preached by the apostles and the new priesthoods, the minister of God, and from the atonement of animal sacrifices to atonement by the blood of Jesus. Some wanting so much to confuse this transition period as if any connection to the law and the temple was sure practice law was being reserved for salvation. Those who claimed to keep the law tried to take the three and a half years of Jesus under the law and is fulfilling the law by observance as their authority to force law keeping on church members. This shows a great lack of knowing New Testament truth and a great darkness in the mind about the entire purpose of ushering in a new convent. The apostolic church reacts to law keeping. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled with your words, subserting your souls, singing, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whomer to whom we gave no such commandment, Acts fifteen twenty four, a subverting your souls. To subvert is to destroy his person's faith by falsehood. B, you may be circumcised and keep the law. Circumcision was the issue, but the purpose of circumcision was an obligation to keep the whole law. A male was not considered to be a son of the law until he had been circumcised and reached the age of mitzvah. Thus, the purpose of the Jew Jesus is conflict with the apostles was they wanted Gentile converters to the Messianic Judaism of Jesus to keep the law, and the way to seal the requirement was to command them to be circumcised. Any man who claims to be a law keeper and who does not practice circumcision as a seal of the law is a plain fraud. The law was given to those circumcisers, and those males under the law who observed the laws were all circumcised. To claim observance to the law demands circumcision, and the apostles sent out letters to all the world. They did not give such commandments. Keeping the law or Sabbath was not required by the apostles in Acts fifteen five to twenty nine, in Romans fourteen 
5 to 6, Galatians 4, 9 to 11, or Colossians 2, 14 to 17. 24 reasons why Messianic Christians worship the first day of the week. 1. All seven days, seven years, Sabbaths in the law of Moses have been abolished. 2. The new covenant does not command any particular day to be observed by Christians. Romans 14, 5, 6, Galatians 4, 9 to 11. 3. Christians are free to choose their own day of Sabbath and worship. Romans 14, 5 to 6. 4. Christians are commanded not to permit any man to judge them regarding a Sabbath. Colossians 2, 14, 7. Christian observance of certain days is rebuked by Paul. Galatians 4, 9 to 11. Observing the Sabbath is not named as a requirement of the gospel. Acts 15, 1 to 29. The real and eternal Sabbath is Jesus, not the day. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 29 and Hebrews 4. The fourth commandment, Exodus 28 to 11, was left out of the new covenant. Note Acts 15 to 24. The Jewish Sabbath command deliverance from Egyptian bondage in which Christians had no part, Deuteronomy 15, 515. Going under the law to observe a Sabbath would oblige one to keep the whole law of Moses, including circumcision, Galatians 3, 10 to 14, Galatians 5, 3, 9, 11, James 2, 10. 11. Worship on the day of the week or any other day of the week serves the same purpose as the Sabbath. 12. After the resurrection of Jesus, first Christians met and worshipped on the first day of the week. John 21, 19, 26-29, Acts 26-12, 2 Corinthians 16, 1, 2. The Lord Jesus fulfilled the last Sabbath while lying in the tomb. There he completed the redemptive work over his victory and his victory over death, hell and the grave. He arose early on the first day of the week, and it was until his death, burial, and resurrection. So Christians are baptized in the newness of life and honor resurrection of the first day of the week. 14. Christian special manifestations to his disciples after resurrection were on the first day of the week. If he wanted them to meet him on the Sabbath or worship, he would have appeared unto them on the Sabbath, but he appeared unto them at the first day of the week. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 23 to 24 and John 20, 19, 16. And I don't know what it is, but always as a child, I always had Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in my head. That was what I was told to learn as a child. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I don't know why, but that's what I was told to learn. <clears throat> 16. Um... Sorry, 15, after the resurrection, there was no recognition given by Jesus to any apostle to the old Jewish seventh-day Sabbath. 16, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 1, 4, was on the first day of the week, the day after the seven Jewish Sabbaths were ended, to signify that all requirements of the Sabbath were fulfilled when a person receives a baptism under the Holy Ghost. After Christ's ascension, the first sermon was preached on the first day of the week, and this conversation, about 3,000, took place on the first day, Acts 2, 1 to 42. We hold high honour that the Lord Jesus would begin his work of the worldwide kingdom of salvation upon the first day of the week, so we do not hesitate to hold church on Queen Day of the week, the first day for what is when the bride as the queen received her promise as a future wife. Sabbath worship is to revert back to the old whore the old queen day of she who was divorced and put away by cavalry. We are not children of she who was divorced, so we cannot worship on her old queen day as if we were part of her. That was like an explanation in the marriage. The absence of any warning by Jesus or apostles regarding or breaking the Sabbath and doing being sinful or mark a beast, as some teach, to observe the first day of the week shows it was acceptable as the day of the Sabbath, and worship but Sunday Sabbath was not a test, New Testament law. 19. Typically, the Old Covenant makes the first day of the week prominent. The Feast of First Fruits, the Pentecost, were absorbed on the first day, as well as the Feast of Unleveled Bread, the Tabernacles, Leviticus 23, 8-14, and Leviticus 34-39. God honoured the first day by stepping out of the darkness of eternity and showing that he was God on the day. 
The Jews claim that God gave the law on the first day of the week, Exodus 19, 1, 3, 11, Leviticus 23, 5, 9, with Exodus 12, 2, 18. 21, God honored many days of the week in Israel, 2 Chronicles 7, 10, 2 Chronicles 29 to 17, Ezra 3 to 6, Nehra 18, 14. God honored the first day of the week. Again, by giving the book of Revelation on that day, Revelation one ten notes Acts twenty seventeen note the Lord's day cannot refer to the Sabbath because it refers to Jesus as Lord, and His day must refer to the resurrection on the first day of the week. The new convent frees all converts from bondage to the old convent, such as death penalty for cooking, making fires, and performing other duties on the Sabbath. Exodus sixteen to twenty three, Exodus twenty eight to ten, Exodus thirty one fifteen, Exodus. 35, 2 to 5, Leviticus 23, 3, Numbers 15, 32. The New Testament never records a distinctive gathering of Mesorite Christian texts on the Jewish Sabbath. To the contrary, the Mesorite Christians gathered on the first day of the week, which was called the Lord's Day, Revelations 1, 10, John 21 to 19, note Acts 27, 2 Corinthians 16 to 2, that the first day was later named Sunday, meaning nothing. And the days of the week are named after the Norse gods, <clears throat> like Thursday is Thor's day, um, Wednesday is Loki's, um, fr- fr- Friday is Faraday, and Odin is um, Saturday. Um, <clears throat> Of the 60 times the word Sabbath are found in the New Testament, it is used 50 times before the New Covenant was made. Of the remaining 10 times, six occurrence refer to Paul preaching to the Jews at non-Masonic gatherings when attendees in signal got of the Jewish Sabbath days, Acts 13, 14, 42, 44, Acts 17, 1, 2, Acts 18, 4. These instances refer to the law of Moses being read by Jews on Jewish Sabbath, Acts 13, 27, Acts 15 to 21. And not one time that they were meeting of the Mesoronic Christians, one place refers to Jewish travel as not more than mile of Sabbath, Acts 1-2. And one place plainly says that the Sabbaths were all abolished. Colossus, Coles 2-14-70. If there had been commandments to worship any day, even the first day, it would have been brought about the same bondage as the law of Moses, the higher principles of Christianity would have been regarded to regulated to the days of seasons which God promised to abolish. Isaiah one thirteen, Hosea two eleven, and indeed abolish two Corinthians three six to fifteen, Galatians three nineteen to twenty five, Galatians four twenty one to thirty, Galatians five one to three, Ephesians two to fourteen, fifteen, and Colossians Colossians two to fourteen to seventeen, Hebrews six twenty ten to eighteen. Whereas Hebrew, whereas Israel was obliged to commemorate freedom from bondage with the yoke of bondage, which included the Sabbath-keeping law, Christians are free to commemorate their freedom and their salvation from the bondage of sin on any day they choose. Romans fourteen five to six. Give offerings on the first day. Christians gathered for worship and fellowship on the first day of the week. If they had been meeting on the seventh day, it would stand to reason Paul would have designated that day as the one to make the offering sing, receive the corrections, but he did not. He pointed out the first day of the week for the offence. Upon the first day of the week, let everyone you lay by him in store as God has pr- pr- prospered him, that there be no gathering where I come. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Upon a day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. Collections were taken up upon the first day of the week, our Sunday today. The early church of the Christians observed their day Sabbaths, Worshipping John twenty one nineteen twenty six Acts twenty nine, but it was not made into binding Sabbath law. The Lord's Day proving to be the first day of the week, so the disciples and Moses teach. So yeah, this is just going into Sabbath. So, yeah, <laughs> there's your response. Um, 
I'm pretty sure I gave you some references to um, what the word abolished mean and what, you know, what those two commandments were. Um... So yeah, as I said, there's two. So. So yeah, it is clear from these passages that whoever abolished completely became null and void. Did man do it? No. Who took away the law then? Jesus Christ took it away with the law covenant, instituted place a new covenant. What did Jesus abolish? He caused to cease, to vanish away, to be fulfilled by him. All covenant and the law of the original Ten Commandments contained in the Book of Law. The word or ordinance in the Greek means dogma also translates to decree and ordinance. And the word ordinance in the Old Testament means statutes and means regulations were considered laws and the laws were considered commandments. The term is then changeable. The Ten Commandments were ordinances, statutes, the Book of the Law.